Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 448, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with Mr. Winston Douglas Wood, the creator of Fantasy. Now this is the first time uh, that Mr. Wood has ever done a live interview, and it's right here on Matt Chat. So <laughs> I want to say thanks at the outset to Cert R for helping me contact uh, Doug and get him on the show. Uh, in this part of the interview, we talk a little bit about uh, Wood's early days and him and his cousin while they were working on the original fantasy series and Star Commander. Uh, and then we get into a lot of uh, RPG mechanics discussions, the races, the skills, uh, auto mapping, and much, much more. A lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Winston Douglas Wood. Hello, folks. I am here today with none other than one of the founding fathers of the computer role-playing game, one of the guys that got the whole thing started, the great Winston Douglas Wood. We're going to call him Doug today. How are you doing today, Doug? I'm doing great today. We're in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and so I guess I'm doing as well as can be expected. It is a trying time. But, uh, yeah. Thanks for taking some time to, to do this interview. I know there'll be a lot of people interested in to hear what you have to say today uh, welcome i'm glad to glad to be here now let me give you guys a quick summary uh, if there, there might be like one percent of you who don't know <laughs> you know about doug but uh he is one of the or he created one of the first computer role-playing game series uh, that's called of course fantasy p-h-a-n-t-a-s-i-e uh, which consists of four games uh, the first three are probably the better known ones. The first one I see came out in 85, and then they did one every year up until 87. Uh, the fourth one is the Japanese, was released to the Japanese market in 1990. We'll get to all this stuff later. <laughs> uh, our friend CRPG Addict puts uh, the fantasy series in his top 20%. You know, some people would, would go a lot higher. I have plenty of uh, CRPG fans that say that's their favorite game, period. A lot of people started with fantasy that's what got um, him hooked on this uh on this genre he also did a crpg set in space uh called star command and we'll also talk about a later game called star fire uh, so we've got quite a bit to uh talk about here doug uh i understand you began began working on fantasy originally while you were a sophomore in college you were studying computer science I'm guessing you must have had an Apple II. Just kind of paint the picture for me. Yeah, so I was studying electrical engineering. and um, So it wasn't computer I, science? No, no. I, I, I figured at the time I, I knew all I needed to know about programming, so I studied electrical engineering, but I didn't take any computer science classes. Uh, None. Just tested it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a mistake, but um, that's what I figured at the time. And I, so I had the Apple II, and... Um, I I was inspired by playing um, Ultima One and Wizardry One, and uh, playing D and D and RuneQuest, and just hit me. You know, I think I could do better. I, I think I could nice. make my own. So, were you playing these on an Apple II? Yes, yes, I had an Apple II. That was the only computer I had. How'd you uh, end up with the Apple II? <laughs> I borrowed it actually uh, from the university that I was going to to uh, do some programming for them, and they they never asked for it back. So nice. I kept it. <laughs> it was an old. It has. It was black and white monitor, one floppy drive, no hard drive, of course. Uh, so it was pretty limited, but uh, it it did the trick. It gave me what I needed to to do. Oh wow! So that was the machine that you develop fantasy on yeah yeah and it was borrowed from the university <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it had a sticker on the back property of the university and i never gave it back yeah, you ever hear from their alumni association there 
<laughs> they asked me for money. Oh. I feel a little more obligation to give them some. It was the University of Kentucky, actually. Huh. Uh, so where does your cousin Eric, I understand, let's see his last name, Liebenauer? Liebenauer. Liebenauer. Uh, Italian. So where does he fit in? I, I was reading that he was 15 years old. I guess he was sort of an art artistic prodigy. Yeah, yeah. So um, for Fantasy 1, 2, and 3, he was really just a play tester. Mm-hmm. Um, and for Star Command, he played a very big role. He was really into a lot of different uh, tabletop RPGs. And... Um, when I said I was going to do a science fiction one, he was very interested, and he—I guess he was at that time more like 18 instead of 15. But uh, he did uh, maybe 17. I can't remember. He did about half of the design of the uh, plot, the different structures, the space stations, or what, or dungeons, whatever they were that you would explore. He designed about half of those, and he designed like all the weapons, the names of the weapons the stats on how they work. Wow, but, you, you, know. you, were, you must have been like the coolest cousin in the history of, <laughs> of the world. <laughs> <laughs> he might say so. I don't know. And yeah, Eric, a lucky guy. Him, so. Wow. Uh, so you mentioned you'd, you'd played a lot of Ultima 1, a lot of wizardry. You know, I've had probably a majority of the guests on this program. You know, they either... It was either one of those two that's, that's just sort of ignited their passion, of their, uh, not just for playing, but for creating, you know, computer role-playing games. So a lot of influence. A lot of influence. Uh, wondering, how do you compare those two? You know, they, we put them in this category of computer role-playing game, but you know, there's obviously quite a bit of differences there. So I'm wondering what you, how you compare those, and what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of those titles? Uh-huh. Yeah, I think of Ultima as a really fun game. It uh, creates a fun world, um, and it feels like it's a a true uh, full fantasy world. Um, But it's pretty light on the character development and combat, um, and the dungeons were really not, not noteworthy. Whereas Wizardry was quite the opposite. It really had very good character development combat system and uh, exploring the dungeon, which which is the only thing you did in Wizardry, but it was really well done. So uh, I guess I I liked some aspects of both of them, uh, but felt like they could, uh, th- those good aspects could be combined along with some other things from other tabletop games. Have you ever had a chance to meet Lord British or any of the folks who worked yes. on Wizardry? Um, quite a few times. I, I you have a good I relationship, would, or was it? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, went to the first three Dragon Cons in Atlanta back in, I guess, the late '80s, and met him there, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, just meeting all the people there, like Michael Moorcock and. Oh wow. Uh, Stephen uh, King and um, so forth. It was a lot of fun to, to go to those things, especially as a guest and be behind the scenes. Um, but I met him there and, and got to know him pretty well. And then when Star Command uh, was being developed, I sent it to his company, which was called Origin Systems at the mm-hmm. time, to see if they wanted to publish it. And they were very interested. And it would have been great to have, to have worked with them and, and done that. But SSI had a right of first refusal clause in their contract, and there was really just no way around it. So SSI mm-hmm. ended up publishing it. But um, I, I often think, you know, what, what what would have happened with Star Command had had Origins published it, and would that have led to other games? Uh, I don't know. It's kind of fun to think about, but it didn't happen. Yeah, was that was that around the time they had done Wing Commander? Yes, um, I I think so. Uh, Wing Commander sounds pretty familiar. Bad blood. And There's a couple of space. I'm trying to think of there, their space there was, uh, there was one they were working on, to, and um, 
I met with the guy who was developing that quite a bit, and uh, it might have been Wing Commander. I, I don't remember what the name was. In fact, we talked about what what he should name it. <laughs> uh, so, I, but I don't know what he finally came up with. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it was a fun fun to go there. They were located in Connecticut at the time. Uh, it's fun to go to Connecticut and meet. Uh, I spoke with Lord British again, Richard Garriott again there. And uh, so I got to know him pretty well, and it, it was fun. It was a fun experience. Well, we might be jumping the gun a little bit here, but you said that the you uh, were kind of wondering what could have happened if Origin had published that instead of SSI, Star, uh-huh. Star Command. What, what do you think would have been different? Well, at that time, the PC, I, I, I developed Star Command on the PC, um, but the Commodore 64 was still the big platform, and the Apple II was even bigger. And um, if if they had done a, a really good conversion to the Commodore 64 and it had been a big seller, then there would certainly have been a lot of uh, demand for a sequel. And I think... They could have been really good at helping me to develop the game and improve the game. Mm-hmm. Um, with the original Fantasy One, SSI uh, assigned a developer, they called it, to me. His name was Keith Roars. Oh, sure. And he did a really good job of helping me to make the game more cohesive. And he did a lot to improve the quality of Fantasy One. Um, but with Fantasy 2 II and 3 and Star Command, it didn't really happen too much. Um, I guess for one thing, I was probably a little more experienced and um, whatever. But uh, when I met with Origin Systems, they said, look, we're the best in the business at, at this, at, at helping you to improve your game, giving you resources, um, whatever you need, and giving you a lot of help in the belt. Mm. So I guess that's kind of what I was thinking. I wonder how, how how much they could have improved it. What about the wizardry folks? Do you ever get to, to meet with them? They had zero techs? Or... No, no, I didn't. Robert um, Woodhead? I, I, I never got to meet him. No idea what he was like or anything. But um, I did submit fantasy to them. But I think it was probably a little too similar to wizardry to suit them. I, I guess they felt that Wizardry was a good product and this wasn't going to complement it in any way. Well, along the same lines, you've, you're talking about some of the tabletop role-playing mm-hmm. games you were playing. Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons, of course, but but also one I, I don't hear about as often. Uh, RuneQuest. Mm-hmm. Everybody talks about D&D, but you know, I'm always kind of like, well, what's this other system? You know, What, what was that like? Uh, you said it was more influential on you in terms of combat and, the, I guess, the character system. You know, I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more uh, on what appealed to you about that game and then how it influenced you in, in ways that D&D didn't. I guess probably it influenced me uh, a lot because it was the first game that I really played extensively with a you know, consistent group week after week. Is it just coincidence, uh, or were they... Quiz, were they, uh, were they, had they played D and D before and, and went to Rune Quest? I don't. I don't know. I, they had played D and D for sure. I'm not sure why they ended up with Rune Quest. I, I was just like, you know, just enjoying the experience right. uh, in high school. Um, but Rune Quest is more, um, I guess, number oriented statistics. Um, everything has a percentage, and the percentages go up. Uh, for your skills as you use them. Um, and it also had the hit locations. You could get hit in the arm, get hit in the chest, and that came into play, I think, in Fantasy Three and Star Command. I, I liked that and used it. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I just kind of think of it as more uh, more statistical than D&D, mm-hmm. or the version of D&D that I was playing at the time. And um, just had a bigger influence on me, and uh, I I combined that with uh, the D and D kind of level system as well. Uh, so 
the percentages that you were able to obtain increased as you increased levels. Um, so it was a combination of the D and D and the the RuneQuest uh, combat and character development systems. It sounds like it sort of. Uh, I guess I want to say more. It was more mathematical or more transparent. The I, I, math I think operations. It's more mathematical. It's it's been you know, almost forty years since I played it. So, uh, but my recollection is it was more mathematical um, and probably appealed to me on that level. Um, yeah, I hear people say was, something similar today about D and D versus uh, Pathfinder. No. I say, well, Pathfinder's a lot more complex. You know, it's for people that can actually add and <laughs> subtract. <Yeah. laughs> like, I don't know if that's fair. But, you know, I could see as somebody who was studying engineering and really interested in, you know, and, and good with math, you know, you'd want a system that would play to your strengths. Wouldn't, right. You weren't intimidated by it. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, so since we're going to get into Star Command uh, later on, I was just uh-huh. wondering, had you played Traveler? Because a lot of people compare that to Traveler. No, as a matter of fact, I had not played any science fiction tabletop or computer games at all. Um, I, I, as I said, I developed it with Eric Liebenauer, and he had maybe played a couple, but um, in that sense, it's much more of an original creation. Um, it was just a lots of the ideas in Star Commander just off the top of my head from playing different role playing mm-hmm. games and you know reading and what what not uh, I'd say it was a re- really an original creation I was not influenced by any other science fiction games directly for sure well, sometimes I think the stuff that gets posted on Wikipedia or Moby Games sites like that they always want to try to say well this you know, this was an influence from this, and this was influenced by that. Right. Like, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just seems that way, I guess, to them. You know, I mean, people can have ideas just on their own without having to necessarily have seen it somewhere else before. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get into fantasy. Uh, well, the first fantasy. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with this game. I notice what a lot of people talk about first, or what really strikes them when they start, is the number of races uh, that uh-huh. you can choose from a lot of games. Maybe there was only one op, maybe there were no options, or just if there were very, you know, the usual suspects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you've uh, got a lot of options here. So, yeah, what, 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 why did you I, feel the need to put so many in? And, and just what was the me, thinking behind it's it? It's kind of like, uh, why did everyone else not feel the need to? Right. I mean, you have this rich world with all these. <laughs> really uh, exotic races, it seems natural that you'd want to use them in. I can't honestly remember if I had a a dungeon master who uh, encouraged that or uh, or what, but I just really liked the idea. And I think um, it's kind of a little bit of a trade-off between reality, such as, you know, as much as there can be reality, and uh, fun, and I I just go for the fun. I I really like uh, these different monsters and races, and thought it was a lot of fun for the, the characters to be able to play. I mean, the players to be able to have them as characters. I'm trying to remember what all you had in there. Min- minotaurs, I wanted to say, and pixies yeah, minotaurs, and sprites, and maybe gi- giants, and yeah, sprites and giants. I can't remember. Uh, trolls, for sure. Yeah, maybe trolls. Um, <laughs> ogres. <laughs> I see you're way ahead of the curve on that. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. So uh, they were either like big fighters or they were little kind of uh, thieves type uh, characters. Uh, I understand. It's quite a different experience, too. It's not like just a, you swap a sprite out or something. I mean, there's a lot of difference amongst these uh, races in terms of gameplay, right? Yeah, there there was a, a puzzle or two that uh, you, you could uh, you had to solve by having the right race and you know having a character of the right race and um, so yeah, have, the the races did influence the game a little bit in those ways. Yeah, well, it seems to be one of the things. I notice even 
you know, you always take the magazine reviews with a, with a grain of salt, but, you know, even the right. ones that were trying to be uh, harsh or whatever, they, even they had to point out, you know, it's really cool. <laughs> all, right. all, the, all these options, you know, you know, we're just not used to seeing. Mm-hmm. And something I was talking about on Twitter a little bit, I was, as I was researching for this, mm-hmm. I came across a couple of your, I didn't find a whole lot of early interviews. You know, there's one with the RPG Codex I read. Mm-hmm. Uh but there was, I think it might have been there, uh, where they were asking about Nicodemus, you know, the big oh, the right, big villain. Right. I probably am guilty of this. I just assume, well, that must be just a cool name, or if there's a story behind it, maybe something, you know, it's biblical, I believe. Uh, but you yeah. say no, in that interview, you say no, it's actually from a book called, this is so cool, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Uh-huh. You know, that's yeah. a great movie, love I- that. Yeah, it was a, 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 a book. I guess a book and a movie. I'm not positive about that, but uh, my first uh, introduction to the name was just a, a friend uh, playing T and D used the name. I guess he had seen the the movie um, and used the name, and I liked it. And I, I, I at first I thought it was just from that movie, and I didn't realize it was biblical until a little later myself. Yeah, that's a movie that. You know, somebody was talking about this on Twitter too. It's such a great movie, you know, and uh-huh. but just so no nobody sees it or nobody. You, know, you talk to people that have seen it, they're like, "Oh yeah, that's a great." Um, <laughs> you know, but you know, majority of people just look at you like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it was a kind of early example of a movie cartoon movie with some vo- real violence in there. Mm-hmm. Like some kids got disturbed by that. I guess. Uh... So you had mentioned Moorcock a while ago. Did you, I guess you were reading him or some of the other fantasy authors? At the time. I read him a little bit, but I, I just mentioned him because I met him in that uh, one of those first Dragon Cons, um, which I did. It was just kind of a cool fanboy moment. Um, uh, I read, um, of course, uh, Lord of the Rings and the Narnia books mm-hmm. uh, um, and a few other classics. Uh, but I can't say that any of them were a huge influence on on fantasy. Just uh, just fun things. Another thing that gets brought up a lot about fantasy, especially mm-hmm. compared to those other games we're talking about, Ultima One and of course Wizardry, is the mm-hmm. what they call an auto mapping system. You know, I feel like that's a term that gets applied sort of retro, <laughs> retroactively yeah. or whatever. I don't, uh, but anyway, it certainly was a fact. You you're not you're not having to break out the graph paper mm-hmm. and make your make your map that yeah, way. I, I my recollection is I just from the very beginning thought, wow, this would be great, um, and uh, can work well with the limits of the Apple II computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whereas Wizardry had um, one really cool view of uh, of a dungeon. Um, I felt like my graphics were maybe not as polished as Wizardry, but I was showing a lot more stuff. I was showing the characters. I was showing the the world above the dungeon. I was showing the the, the layout of the dungeon itself. And so I thought I was communicating a lot mm-hmm. of information pretty well. Um, and that was just part of it, being able to do that, that auto mapping and uh, save it and bring it back at the time, you know. Technology being what it was, it was uh, it was kind of a cool thing, and um, I, it really hasn't been uh, redone a lot, I don't think. Um, but I, I, from the very beginning, I really wanted to do it, and I thought it was kind of a nice feature. Yeah, absolutely, we we'll get into the, in the combat, you know, as well. But I, I like a game where you can see the characters. Mm-hmm. You know, as I, if I recall. You know, I've played so many of these things. Who can remember yeah. <laughs> all the details? But <laughs> I think with Wizardry, you didn't ever see your characters, right? It was just names. No, no. Uh, graphically, yeah. the only thing I think that you ever saw was a sort of a wireframe view into the dungeon, and it was well done for, for you know for the early eighties. It was really well done, but that's all you saw. And uh, I wanted to be able to see the characters, um, and admittedly didn't do a great job of depicting the characters but to, just to be able to see what's going on I think is, yeah yeah exactly 
just being able to see what's going on, uh, I think is really nice and, um, see where they are in relation to each, to each other. Well, victory dances. and Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's something I talk about or I've thought a lot about is, you know, a lot of these CRPGs, it's, they got this sort of morbid, really somber tone to mm-hmm. them. You know, I mean, <clears throat> To me, that's just, yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, but I like a game. You know, I kind of want to play a game with characters that, you know, these guys are having a ball. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to be part of that. Yeah, I, I hope that that uh, came through. If it did, I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I don't want to redu- uh, introduce anything that's intentionally supposed to be funny um, or like an anachronism or whatever, but... Um, to yeah, to to have the different races, I think gives a, a little lightheartedness, and just the general look of it, I think, gave it a lightheartedness mm-hmm. that made it fun. Hopefully, so you aren't one of these types that loved breaking out the colored pencils and the the graph <laughs> paper, and you know, because some people talk about that. They, I don't know if there's just nostalgia talking, or they they just have really fond. Uh, they're really fond of maps, you know. I don't know <laughs> what it is. I yeah, mean, I I liked it. playing D and D and RuneQuest. I I, I kind of liked you know, making the map um, okay, but uh, I didn't find it on computer games. I didn't find it uh, Ultimate Wizardry. I didn't find it to be. Uh, it was just kind of frustrating uh, more than anything else. Um, so I. I was happy to do the uh, top view. That was another way, I guess, you're ahead of the curve because you know that <laughs> it's hard to find a game nowadays where <laughs> uh, there's not some kind of a where you're basically expected to make a map on on your own, right? Right, right, yeah. As looking at some of the uh, the footage, you know, again, this is probably retro, you know, applying something later, mm-hmm. whatever, but. Uh, I'm wondering if you had ever played Rogue or any of those sort of Unix-based uh, role-playing games. Uh, no, no. Any Plato I games? Or? No, no. Um, didn't I played the original Adventure? Uh, oh, sure. Uh, quite a bit, but um, did you make a map? <laughs> <laughs> no. You need a map. Probably should have. In that case, it would have been helpful. Um, but yeah, I I didn't get to play any of those others. Another cool thing about this game, uh, the mm-hmm. the idea of a passive skill. You know, I think this came up in the RPG Codex interview as well. You know, something you mm-hmm. see in a few CRPGs, but it's relatively rare, I would say. You know, whereas tabletop common. You know, you're listening yeah. for things, and you got the passive perception scores and all, all this stuff. I just uh, what, uh, wondering what your thoughts are in general about that mechanic. Uh, like you said, I, it's, it's pretty common and pretty critical in uh, tabletop games, depending on the, the dungeon master. But um, it was always for me, and it uh, it gives you uh, the opportunity to create a, a more well balanced. Uh, more true role playing, I think, and um, get get attached to your characters. You know, if if the guy who can pick locks is almost dead, it it you know mm-hmm. it's much more dramatic than if uh, just some other one of your seven fighters is almost dead. You know, everyone has particular skills. Um, I think it's more fun and and like I said, more get more attached to them. They seem more real. And it's fun too to think about the, the character and what type of skills that person would want to develop. Yeah. yeah. Thinking about a Minotaur picking the lock. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be that'd be well, a sight to see. The thing that's fun about having all those races and all those skills is, yeah, you can do that, and once in a while the Minotaur is going to get it, you know, and it's kind of <laughs> fun, <laughs> but no one else can. And that's it for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Got lots of uh, more uh, stuff from uh, Doug coming up. We really just kind of scratched the surface here. Uh, Really excited about this. You probably know I wanted to have him on the show forever. 
Now, I wanted to talk to him even back when I was doing the first Dungeons and Desktops book. I was like, man, this <laughs> would be great to talk to uh, the creator. And, you know, after I guess it's over 10 years, I finally get to talk to him. So it's really, uh, really exciting. Kind of a little dream come true for me. Uh, so thanks again to uh, Cert R for helping me get in touch with Doug and, and do these interviews. Really, really awesome stuff. Uh, as always, I want to thank you as well. Thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show, keeping Matt Chat on the air for all these years. So many episodes, so many guests, so much more to come. Uh, so thank you so much for doing your part, uh, you know, to uh, help me do these interviews and episodes. Uh, you know, if you are in a position to, I know a lot of folks are having a hard time right now, so don't worry about it if you are. Uh, but if you're not, go to that link in the show note to the Patreon site. You can sign up to support the show there. And if you haven't watched the show in a while, you might not have heard that I've switched from a weekly or a per episode fee uh, to a monthly fee uh, over at Patreon. So if you want to do the buck a show thing, uh, you actually need to go and update your Patreon account to three bucks or four bucks because uh, otherwise you'll be paying a buck a month. <laughs> uh, so anyway, just bringing that to your attention, but... Again, you know, I understand folks are hurting right now, so I'm not going to make a big deal about supporting uh, Mad Chat. Uh, we can worry about that later, right? Uh, all right, anyway, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, first up is our good friend Shane, good buddy Shane, uh, brought this to our attention. Mist is getting a TV series. <laughs> so I know there's a lot of full motion video in this series. I guess I've kind of taken that to the extreme now. Uh, this being written by, let's see, did I get the name? Ashley Edward Miller. Uh, she wrote Thor and X-Men uh, First Class. Uh, so pretty good writing uh, chops, you know, really, uh, who knows what this will look like. You know, the, a lot of people were pointing out that there's a novel called Mist. I actually have it, haven't read it yet, but people are telling me it's a really good novel, and if they kind of stick to that, it should be pretty good TV show as well. Uh, anyway, who knows, but I am definitely intrigued. Uh, let me know what you think. And Alan wrote in about this. This is pretty, uh, pretty awesome. If you remember those old BBSs and the ASCII and ANSI graphics, this is called Stone Story RPG. It's, it's what they're calling an auto RPG. <laughs> it kind of plays itself. Uh, with strategic combat, deep crafting, and programming elements and animated entirely in ASCII art. Uh, so they go on quite about, uh, you can read about this. There's a lot of AI that does the exploring, combat, and looting. Uh, they say it's not, however, an idle game. You do uh, lots of stuff. You make potions, special abilities. Uh, there's got boss boss fights in there. Uh, anyway, it's in early access now. It's uh, 16 bucks. You know, I think it's worth a look just for this cool uh, ASCII uh, style. You know, it's been a while since I've seen anything like this. <laughs> uh, pretty cool. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Matt wrote in, Matt W. wrote in about this, the unofficial sign failed adventure game pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of guys, uh, they're trying to uh, see if there's any interest in this, I suppose. Maybe they just did this for a joke. I don't know. Uh, but it's kind of a point-and-click adventure game based on Seinfeld. Uh, Seinfeld? <laughs> Seinfeld? Uh, Seinfeld. Uh, looks pretty good. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, you know, they're not really sure about how they'll be able to get the, uh, the copyrights or, you know, legal permission to do it. So it might just be kind of this weird thing for now, a little bit of a... Anomaly, but we'll see. Uh, hopefully, they'll be able to do more with that. All right, that will do it. Uh, let's wrap it up, though, with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes from Michael Moorcock. You know, his name keeps coming up, it seems like, lately in my uh, latest series of interviews. I got kind of curious, like, how many quotes does he have lying around? And there's <laughs> actually quite a few to choose from. Uh, I thought this one was pretty awesome, though. It goes something like this. Treasures are not won by care and forethought, but by swift slaying and reckless attack. <laughs> Sounds like something Minsk would say. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next week.
I am the warden of Orphanage 43, one of the many orphanages that border the wasteland. Children are brought here at an early age to be indoctrinated, to serve the system. It hurts me to do what I do. I too must serve the system.